You are one of the lucky ones. You're old enough to remember blue skies and puffy white clouds, the feel of a soft breeze on your skin, and the crispness of fresh mountain air. But Impact Day changed all that forever. It arrived unexpectedly, flying into our solar system from somewhere far out in interstellar space. A rogue comet likely ejected out of its own solar system and wandering the galaxy for millions of years until the passage of a nearby star gave it just enough of a tug to send it flying in a new direction, straight on an intercept course with our solar system. The comet flew in on a highly elliptical trajectory, similar to 2017's discovery of Oumuamua, the first interstellar object ever discovered by humanity. Few then knew that it was an omen of something worse to come. When Object Zeta, as it came to be called by the media, entered our solar system, we had the bad luck of it flying toward Earth from behind the sun, blinding us to the danger. As it swung around the sun, it finally became visible to our telescopes on Earth, but it would still take months to spot the threat. By the time it passed out of the orbit of Venus, it was too late to even think of a planetary survival strategy. Less than four months later, Object Zeta made impact somewhere in Southeast Asia, wiping out millions of people upon its initial impact. The massive tsunamis that followed the impact event reached heights of over 100 feet tall, drowning the coasts of Australia, Japan, Taiwan, Hawaii, and the West Coast. Water reached up to neck deep all the way to the famous Hollywood Walk of Fame. Millions more died in the flooding. But the worst was yet to come. On land, Object Zeta's impact created forest fires that raged for months, completely out of control. Debris from the impact started new fires all the way in southern Russia and as far west as Pakistan. Global trade collapsed overnight, nations left to fend for themselves with no organized effort to stop the massive blazes. The earth burned for three months before all the fires finally smoldered out. Asia was an uninhabitable wasteland. The massive jungles and deep forests that were spared deforestation were now nothing but ash, putting incalculable trillions upon trillions of tons of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, sulfur oxides, and nitrogen oxides into the atmosphere. The real damage came from the debris cloud which choked off the sun's rays for a year and a half before finally clearing. But when the sun finally dawned on the earth again, it was barely visible from all the smog still clogging the atmosphere. It was at least enough for photosynthesis, but it was too late by then. The only plants to have survived grew in the few labs and artificial farms set up to weather the nuclear winter-like conditions. The sprawling forests of North America were now nothing but dry tinder, and perfect fuel for fires started by random electrical storms. Fire ruled the world until there simply wasn't much left to burn anymore, and humanity moved into their domed habitats, living off lab-grown plants and breathing recycled air, artificial air, if you could afford it. Despite having been 20 years since Impact Day, things haven't improved much for you. Your bubble city is a bit bigger than it used to be, which is good news in a way. Maybe humanity can bounce back, eventually. You know there's other bubble cities out there because you've driven to them. You're one of the few brave or foolish enough to drive convoys between bubble cities trading in vital supplies and sharing new discoveries that can help humanity survive on the knife's edge it finds itself on. Your truck is specially designed for the task. It features puncture-proof wheels and a snowplow-like shovel at the front that can be lowered in place to push through obstacles you might encounter on the old shattered roads of the former American Midwest. The most important feature of your truck, though, is the cab. It's been environmentally sealed to keep you alive. There's oxygen in the outside world, but breathing it for more than a few minutes will kill you. The impact event set off an environmental disaster of unprecedented scale. Though it'd be unfair to blame it all on the comet, humanity was putting plenty of chemicals into its own atmosphere for centuries, and the thousands of cities that burned to ash after the impact were all made of highly toxic substances. When they went up in smoke, they injected a witch's brew of toxins into the atmosphere where they've lingered for decades. You've heard scientists talk about one day the atmosphere clearing up enough to breathe outside, but it won't be for decades yet. For now, you have to make do with canned air inside your environmentally sealed cab as you plow through the remains of a former American superpower. You enter your truck for another routine run to Habitat Joy, the nearest dome city to have survived until today. Most of the dome cities that sprung up as the atmosphere became increasingly lethal never made it past a few years. Poor social planning or lack of renewable resources led to their inevitable collapse. You hear that Joy is possibly on this growing list of failed human outposts. The news isn't good. There's social unrest as food and clean air shortages mount. Plus, there's rumors they're having power problems. You're carrying a truckload of air filters and pumps badly needed by Joy if it's going to make it another year. In a former lifetime, this would be one innocuous load out of the millions traveling the American highway system at any given time. Today, your cargo is more precious than gold or platinum. 
You've heard rumors of bandits who attack trucks traveling the lonely post-apocalyptic roads while breathing masked air. Supposedly, they retreat back to caves or the ruins of office buildings that they've hermetically sealed off, living on plundered scraps and what they can salvage from the old world. You've even heard they eat each other or their victims. That's all nonsense, though. Life in a habitat city is barely survivable as is. Nobody can make it out there. Your truck is fueled up and you're glad you don't have to pay the massive bill yourself. Gasoline is as precious as a commodity as clean air. However, you're responsible for the bill to fill your truck's oxygen tanks and swap out the air purifiers. You hear that oxygen used to just cost pennies per cubic foot. Now it costs you 500 bucks just to fill your truck's tanks for three days there and three days back. That's more expensive than your daily oxygen bill at your apartment, though. When you're home, your daily oxygen bill is around 12 bucks a day. Like every other apartment, yours is hermetically sealed, with an airlock between home and the outside world. While you can breathe outside your home inside the dome, for which the government charges you a flat $3 a day tax for, each apartment is sealed with an airlock in case of catastrophic failure of the dome itself from a natural disaster or bad maintenance. All it would take is one cracked panel in the honeycomb construction above your head to poison and suffocate the population of 20,000 who live under it. The second reason for the airlock, though, is to keep your oxygen costs under control. Sensors inside your apartment measure how much oxygen you breathe each day. And the last thing you want is a leaky window or a door letting precious oxygen flow out. That's literally money flying straight out the door. With such steep rates for breathable home oxygen, it's no surprise then that few people choose to be particularly athletic anymore. All that extra exertion is a good way to skyrocket your oxygen bill. As your truck is filled up, you make sure to pay extra to have your emergency canned air refilled. You keep several canisters of compressed breathable air for emergencies along with the gas mask that they fit into. It's very uncomfortable, but in the case of a catastrophic leak, it'll save your life. It also would be good in case you actually need to exit the truck for some reason, but don't relish the thought. Doing so means losing several cubic feet of precious air. Finally, ready to roll, your truck is towed to the massive exterior airlock. The towing vehicle is all electric, of course, no room for wasting precious breathable air with an internal combustion engine inside the dome. Your truck would be electric too, except that the thick, sooty clouds that still crowd most of the sky make recharging on long trips very dicey probability. You'd probably run out of air and asphyxiate long before you finally got a full charge. Plus, the powerful diesel engine is exactly what you need to power several tons through difficult roads that survived the years of neglect and natural disasters after impact day. Your truck's in place in the airlock and the giant steel doors close behind you. You catch one last glimpse of home, a massive dome city that houses 20,000 of humanity's survivors, lit by rows and rows of LED lights, meant to simulate a sunny day and help people fight off depression. Massive pumps suck most of the air out of the room, trying to recover as much of the oxygen as possible before the exterior doors open. They don't pump to a full vacuum, though, that would do nasty things to your truck. You sit in the darkness, listening to the pumps work for a minute before they all finally fall silent. Suddenly, the doors in front of you begin to open, sending a shaft of light into the darkness of your airlock. There's a rush as air fills the near vacuum inside, but you don't hear it until it's almost over. Just like you don't hear the five-ton doors opening as anything louder than a slight hum. With little air in the airlock, you feel the vibrations of the doors opening more than you actually hear them. It's not until the outside air has filled your airlock with toxic atmosphere that you can hear outside noises again. Now with the doors fully open, you bring the truck to life. It coughs and sputters at first due to old age, but eventually comes to life. The massive diesel engine doesn't care about toxic air, it only cares that there's a high enough concentration of oxygen to fuel combustion, of which there is. You've also heard scientists say there's plenty of oxygen in the atmosphere, in fact it's where they get most of the dome's air from. Even with the death of all planet life on Earth, it'll take thousands of years for the accumulated oxygen to be used up or broken down by the sun's rays. The biggest problem is that it's simply not breathable for longer than a few minutes before you're choking to death on the various poisons that accompany it in the atmosphere. There's rumors that there's breathable air down in Australia, but you know that's just idle stupid talk. Most of Australia got drowned in the tsunami after the impact, and the rest all burned to death. There's nowhere left on this planet a human being can step outside and take a breath of safe, clean air, not even on the highest mountain peaks. With the engine rumbling to life, you put the big truck into drive and pull out into the wasteland. Your dome city is built on the ruins of a former Los Angeles, over the hill as they used to say out in the San Fernando Valley, which avoided most of the devastation. It's an unlikely place to survive given the lack of access to things like local drinking water supplies, but the ocean is now 10 miles closer than it used to be, and a few miles of pipe bridge the distance between it and the dome city. 
A desalination plant works to create safe drinking water. It's energy intensive, but the nuclear reactor built by the former American government in the years after impact today can happily supply the needs of your tiny population for a century or more. It isn't things like power or even water that's threatening extinction, at least for your dome city. It's things like tools, maintenance equipment, and other high-tech supplies needed to keep the various systems keeping your dome alive working. That's why your city has prospered, though it sits right in the middle of a chain of human settlements that span the west coast up into Washington state and down to Mexico. Your dome city is a natural trading hub that links the various settlements, and that's why, relatively speaking, it could be considered prosperous. In the old days, with no governments and anarchy, you figure that you'd be prone to attack by bandits or a greedy neighbor, but there's little use for armies anymore when it'd be impossible to move them large distances, and even the slightest damage to a dome city makes it uninhabitable anyway. At least Impact Day did one thing for humanity, it made it a hell of a lot more peaceful, if only because it's just physically impossible to wage war. Today you're going down south toward Mexico. There's a surviving dome down there in Baja, California, built in cooperation between the former US and Mexican governments. As such, it houses both Americans and Mexicans and is one of the more successful settlements to have survived the last few decades. It's also a hub of technology. Whoever built the place was smart enough to invite plenty of America and Mexico's best and brightest. You won't be going that far, though, stopping just shy of the old border at Habitat Joy. You're grateful you're going south only because your route is far flatter than the road going in the mountainous Pacific Northwest. That means you'll burn up less gas, and the few domes that allow traders to buy gas from them charge outrageous prices, knowing that you have no choice but to buy it or die on the road somewhere. The journey is quiet as you travel down old Interstate 5. It used to be a mess of aging rusted wrecks, but by now the traders have plowed a clean path through the wrecks. The real danger today comes from the disrepair of the road. The world as humanity once knew it may have died, but the earth is very much alive and California is just as prone to earthquakes as it ever was. The only difference is now nobody is going out to fix potholes or cracks in the road. As you slow your truck to ease across another large crack in the road, you think to yourself that someday someone's going to have to come out here and actually fix these roads or trade will become impossible. That'll mean death to most of the domes. Few of them are truly self-sufficient. Four hours later, you near the outskirts of San Diego, and you're reminded just how geologically active the American West Coast still is. This part always gives you the creeps, spotting the massive ruined city in the distance drawing closer and closer on the horizon. But what's truly chilling is the wrecked skeleton of a massive dome, many times larger than your own. It was supposed to house 100,000 people, the largest of its kind anywhere in the world and the hope of a few survivors the years after impact day. What precious few resources the old American government could muster went straight into its construction, and it was truly a modern marvel. But somebody had made a serious mistake. Maybe it was misplaced decimal point somewhere, nobody knows. But whatever the mistake was, the dome was fundamentally flawed and structurally weak. When a large 7.0 earthquake struck formerly sunny SoCal, large segments of the dome came crashing down. The skeletons of 100,000 people suffocated in minutes and are still strewn about in the streets below. Even more are locked inside their airtight homes, having starved to death after the disaster, knowing that help would never come and they couldn't leave. What's really haunting though is the small caravan of vehicles littered with skeletons you always have to pass on your route. The skeletons still wear the gas mask their owners had on before their death. Refugees hoping to get to safety before their canned air supplies ran out. They barely made it a dozen miles through the choked roads before whatever breathable oxygen they had simply ran out, and they died in mass by the side of the road. There's no predators anymore to scatter the bones and nobody to move their bodies or even give them a proper burial. Nobody's going to waste the breathable oxygen to bother with the effort. Their vehicles were simply shoved out of the way so that the little traffic that travels the old Interstate 5 could continue unimpeded, ensuring the survival of the human race. Traveling south is cheaper on gas, but the stretch of the road as you pass the skeletal convoy is always the toughest of any you travel. Night falls and you find a spot to pull over, clearing the road so that anyone traveling at night is free to pass by. Truckers were generally known for their courtesy to each other back in the old world, but in this brave new world it's survival necessity. You don't move out of the way, you'll get shoved out of the way. Fuel and air are calculated closely for each trip and nobody has time to waste. Running out of either out here means death, plain and simple. You could maybe make it a half a day on your portable oxygen, so unless you get stranded or break down close to a dome, you're a dead man. The cab of the truck is roomy enough with a door that opens to the rear storage compartment so you can inspect the cargo without having to exit your vehicle. The door, like any outside door, is hermetically sealed in case of a breach of the trailer. You have a small bunk you can sleep in, just like the old truckers, 
and enough battery life to last the night until you recharge it by running the diesel engine. You're unlucky enough to be old enough to remember what it used to be to walk outside and breathe fresh air. So sitting in the cab watching the drab gray world outside and breathing stale recycled air, you long to get outside and stretch your legs, feel what little warmth tomorrow's morning sun might have on your face and the whisper of a cool breeze on your skin. But you can't do any of that if you don't want to waste a massive amount of money repressurizing your cabin. Air is money, and vice versa, and a lot of money at that. You kind of envy the new kids who grew up in the domes never having breathed a single gulp of real natural oxygen. They seem far more at ease with their hermetically sealed trucks than you've ever felt. As you drift off to sleep, you dream of the feel of soft grass on your skin as you lay in a sunny field with big puffy white clouds overhead. You wake up to thunder, another dry lightning storm. The global weather is so badly disrupted that predicting it is next to impossible, especially without the high-tech radar and satellite technology of the old world. But these dry lightning storms are pretty common. You figure it's the interaction of all those densely packed particulates that still linger in the atmosphere. There'll be no sunrise today, not that you get much of one even on a normal day through all the thick, sooty, dark clouds that wrap around most of the world. About 10 years ago, they installed LED screens on the panels of the dome back home so they could create sunny days and puffy digital clouds for people to look at instead of the bleak, gray world overhead. It only ended up confusing the newer generations which had never seen the old sky and making the survivors of the old world extremely depressed. Eventually, they gave up and just turned the LED screens to a calming off-white, like hospital walls. The big truck rumbles to life as you power it up. You never realized it until the moment has passed, but you always hold your breath in anticipation for just a moment as you turn the key. Probably understandable given that if today was the day the engine failed to turn, you'd probably just die out here. You'd heard stories of abandoned trucks on the side of the road, their batteries or engine having cut out and the driver inside slowly suffocating to death, waiting in vain for another truck to pass. Sometimes if the dead truck is near enough a dome, they'll send a salvage crew out. Mostly, the trucks just litter the sides of the freeway, slowly rusting alongside the wrecks of the old world. Putting the truck into drive and pulling out, you cast a quick glance at your oxygen gauges and calculate just how much air you've breathed up, close to 50 bucks by your rough math, and you've still got two more days there and three back. It's actually good news, you'll have plenty of air in reserve in case of emergency. The next two days of your drives are pretty uneventful. The road is surprisingly smooth most of the way, probably why it's a popular trade route, and it's almost calming to settle into your driving routine. You do your best to always be calm, not just because it's good for your mental health, but because it's good for your oxygen bill, too. The calmer you are, the less air you use up. You've even mastered a few waking meditation techniques to lower your heart rate as you drive. It might sound silly to some, but there's a real cost savings in learning to be calm, centered driver. Every single breath you take costs you money, and that's something you've never forgotten since life began under the dome. Finally nearing the third day on the road, you spot a familiar landmark. You're close now. You have to get off the 805 onto the 905 to head toward Joy, but it's not far from the highway intersection. In the old days, the trip might have taken you about five hours with no traffic. In the new world, it takes three days weaving through the shattered roads. Joy is finally coming up, though, and you should be able to see it in the twilight up ahead. Its internal lights illuminating the area around it and making it visible for miles. As you pull closer, though, there's no lights waiting to greet you. In fact, there's nothing at all. It gets dark quick and it's hard to get a good sense of distance with only the lights of your big truck to illuminate your environment, but you're pretty sure you should be within visual range of the dome's exterior lighting by now. You can't shake that gnawing feeling that something is terribly wrong as you spot the familiar turnoff that'll pull you up to the dome's exterior airlocks. These should be well lit even at night and yet there's nothing in the darkness up ahead. The big dome should be right ahead of you, but with no moonlight breaking through the choking cloud cover, the world is pitch black. You know this stretch of road well enough to navigate it safely though, and finally, your lights are bouncing off the exterior airlocks. You put the truck in park and peer outside. There's another truck pulled outside the airlocks and you recognize the markings on the truck designated as one of Joy's own traders. But that truck is lifeless too. You honk your horn, hoping for a response, but nothing from either the truck or the dome. You reach for the shortwave radio that you typically use to contact domes once you're outside their airlock, but there's no response on the radio either. Something's gnawing at you, an uneasy feeling deep in your bones. You knew Joy had problems, but how could an entire dome just go dark all of a sudden? You were here just a week ago and the place was still humming along. You ponder your options, then with a sigh reach for your gas mask. This is going to be expensive, but you have to figure out what's going on. With your breathing mask securely fastened and a canister in place, you shut off the truck's oxygen 
and open the door. There's a rush of air as the pressure equalizes, and you can't help but think of the 40 or so bucks you just wasted opening that door. You hop out of the truck, grateful to truly stretch your legs out, but mindful to move quickly and spend as little time outside the safety of your cab as possible. Without the rebreathers installed on the truck, not only does your canned air last less, but costs you even more. If you bother to do the math, each breath is probably costing you about 5 cents. First, you move to the truck, hoping to make contact with the driver, but as you get to the cab, you realize the door is open. Looks like the driver had the same idea you did, and you can still see a few of his footprints over by the airlock. Looks like he must have tried banging on it to get someone's attention. You follow the footsteps around the airlock to the side, both of you having the same idea of getting to the exterior maintenance ladder so you can hopefully get the attention of someone on the inside. As you come around the airlock to the ladder going up, you spot the driver above you, leaning against the safety railing. You call out to him, but your voice is muffled by the mask you wear. It's strange, he's not moving, and he should have definitely spotted you and your flashlight by now. With growing dread, you climb the ladder until you reach the driver and realize he's dead. You see the cause almost immediately, a rupture of the oxygen canister. It's rare, but it can happen as the pressure changes within the canister as the air is used up. Most of these canisters have seen a decade or more of use, not exactly in the best condition. Inevitably, one's bound to catastrophically fail. The poor driver seems to have not carried a backup. You wish you could do something for him, but dragging down the dead body and taking the time to bury him wouldn't be worth whatever oxygen you might scavenge from his truck, so you simply leave him and continue climbing. Up above is a platform from which you'll be able to peer into the dome and hopefully get someone's attention. The big hexagonal plastic panel is about 3 inches thick and covered in a quarter inch layer of soot and grime that you manage to wipe off. Pressing your face into the panel, you try to peer inside, but it's too dark. Your heart sinks with realization, Joy's power must have failed. Other than a breach of the dome, nothing is more dangerous. When the power goes, the scrubbers go, and that means no air. But if the power failed only recently, the population should still be alive. Maybe you can make contact, find out what they need, get help from somewhere. There's another dome only half a day away you could rush to if need be. You wipe more of the grime away so you can shine your flashlight in and once more press your face to the panel. It's impossible to see much through the plastic eyelets of your own gas mask and the three-inch panel, so you take a deep breath, shut off your oxygen, and rip the mask off, pressing your naked face against the plastic. You can see much better now, and as you sweep your powerful flashlight onto the structures below, terror grips you immediately. There's groups of people huddled together everywhere, but none are moving. Most are keeled over on their side or back. It's clear what happened here. The power ran out, and as the air dwindled, people took to the streets to take their last breaths with their loved ones. You push the mask back on your face and make sure to exhale forcibly, push any toxic air out of the mask before you seal it, then make your way down the ladder. You just witnessed nothing short of a genocide, the death of thousands of people. What makes it worse is that there's probably survivors in some of those buildings living inside their hermetically sealed living spaces and breathing in emergency caches of canned air, waiting for… you're not sure what, because help isn't coming. You're the only one here, and even if you wanted to, there's literally nothing you could do for any of them. There's simply just not enough air. Before you leave, you plunder the other trucker's rig for supplies. Then you back your own up, carefully turn her around. There's nowhere to go but home. Joy won't be needing your cargo anymore or ever again. Another one of humanity's dwindling settlements snuffed out. As you hit the road, you decide you're going to push through the night. You're not really in the mood to sleep. Plus, if you were honest with yourself, you keep thinking about that trucker climbing the ladder when nobody responded to his radio calls and banging on the airlock. You're eager to get back home, or at least to make sure you've got a home left to return to. Glancing at your oxygen gauge, you're easily in the clear. If you breathe easy, you'll make it back home with at least two days to spare. With the sound of tires on gravel, you mentally calculate how far you could get on two days of oxygen and fuel. Ready for more post-apocalyptic videos? Check out What If There Was Nuclear War Between the US and Russia, or click this other video instead.